Lord, we thank you so much that you are so amazing to us. Lord, there's um, nothing in this world that comes close to your, your grandeur, your love, your mercy, your sovereignty. Lord, the, the fact that you have uh, sustained our lives to this point is enough to, to express our love back to you. So as we dig into your word tonight, would you give me words to be able to exhort, encourage, even rebuke, Lord, that your people may be sanctified by your word. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. So these past two weeks, uh, you guys know that I've, I've been a little, uh, not me, okay, let me scratch that. Not me, the word has been a little uh, rough on the ladies. We we're talking about modesty and then the roles in, in the church. Um, women, you know, uh, not taking roles as preachers or, or authority. And now we get into chapter 3 of 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we, we get to dig into the men in this group. Men, uh, fasten your seatbelts. Uh, I know this is going to be talking about deacons, but be sure of something that uh, it will apply. And it is applying to actually all of us. In the same way that when I taught on modesty, you know, there was a footnote there that actually showed uh, for men what modesty actually looks like. And then the authorities in the church, what we're called to as, um, as we are actually called to, to teach the body. And that means actually all the ladies in, in the body itself. This is the calling of all men, but in particular pastors. So now as we go into chapter 3, we get into this portion of scripture um, that I don't want you men. Man, listen, I don't want you to turn off your, your thinking and thinking it's like, this doesn't apply to me. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a deacon. I'm not an elder. No, no. You know, listen up because this will apply to you. So I would disagree. Uh, this is that this is not relevant to all believers. Some say that it's only relevant to this particular office within the church itself. But, it, but it's not. It applies to all. If I could share at least two reasons for this. Let me share two reasons right up front is this. Is that men, I'm talking to you, and this is young men. You know, the high schoolers over here, I'm watching you. You know, the young men that I see here in their 20s and us that are more seasoned, I'm talking to you. We are called to be watchmen. Watchmen to hold leadership to the standards that we're about to look into. And in the same way, as uh, we watch, we notice the calling of others. So we're a watchman to, to hold the leadership to this standard and also to watch to see the roles that are, that are expressed in certain men around us in the church. The second one is this. As a call to godliness, personal godliness, for all of us here. Again, not just pastors, not just elders. So as we explore the numerous qualifications, I, don't, I would ask that you examine yourself. We go through these portions of scripture, you examine yourself and your leadership. Let me clarify that these are qualities, not duties. These are qualities, not duties, meaning this is that these these qualities are not something that a a person that is called that gets to conjure it up. This is something that's already in that person being called to these positions, the position of pastor and elder. So it shows a quality and a depth of godliness that are necessary, necessary for the importance of pastoral labor. Paul's hope is this that as he, as Timothy sees this in Paul, he gets to replicate it in himself. And then the men in the church replicate it thus forth. So it goes down the line showing that, that this applies to all men. And, and ultimately, not just in the church of Ephesus, but in the church as a whole in all times and in all places. So we have 
15 qualities. 15 qualities. Nine character traits in the positive, four in the negative, one in the positive as a command, and one skill. Literally, just one skill. Tonight, we will explore seven of those qualities. So this is actually part one of two. The title of the message is this, The Calling to Lead the Church, part one. The calling to lead the church. So here we tackle seven qualities tonight. Before I announce my points, I want to address one, one point and then pose a question to all of you men here. The, for the question not related to actually the point itself. But let's look at this. First Timothy chapter three, starting in verse one. It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer, then, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Pause there. This is, this is my starting point, if you understand. This is my point that it's going to lay a foundation to what we're going to actually go into the rest of this portion of scripture, the, actually the seven, the seven qualities that you're going to see right now. If you look at the word aspires, it's, it's a simple word, but all it means in the Greek is to desire. Uh, a desire, a yearning, the Greek kind of has uh, this, um, this idea of a yearning. It's not just a, well, I think that would be a, a, a good position to have. I think I want to be a pastor. It's not that simple. It's, it's a yearning deep inside that actually the Lord places there. The office of overseer, it says overseer there, but this overseer is synonymous with elder pastor. If you look at Acts 20, 28, you'll see that. It's interchangeable. When you see overseer, think pastors, think elder. And then he says, it's a fine work. This desire, he says, it's a fine work. In the Greek, it means noble. And actually, I, I love this even better. It means beautiful. So if we put it in this fashion, you say, a man that desires, that yearns for this calling, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And this is why I say this, is this is why I want this foundation to be set, is that as you are in the church, you must see your pastors as a man that is yearning, that is holding a position, that is a beautiful work. It's not just good or noble. It's not just a, a fine work, which is all those things, but it's beautiful. It's beautiful to be able to minister to the people of God for the purpose of God's glory. This may seem contrary to some meaning the position of the pastor. They see it and they think, well, you know, I would never I want that position. I don't see myself as, as doing that because I see too much of what pastors actually go through. But the pastoral calling and ministry begins with a yearning. And it's a high calling. Pastor John put it this way once. He said, they asked him a question. They said, well, how do you know as a young man that you're called to this position, yet you're called to actually be a pastor and elder. And he, he said this, he said, the man that knows this, uh, you could ask him something simple and say, do you see yourself being able to do anything else in this world? If the man says yes, he's not called to the pastoral ministry. He must see it as, I could do nothing else but to preach God's word, to minister to God's people. You know, I've always seen it in this, this fashion when, when I don't like talking about myself, but I, I, I noticed for myself when I heard a message by Dr. Stephen Lawson from, from the 2020 Shepherds Conference, I believe, the 2019, I'm sorry. And when I was listening to it, 
I, I, at that point, I knew I was called, and I, I felt like something. I felt like I was a square peg trying to go into a round hole. Like, what I've been doing up until that point was just trying to shove something into that, that I didn't belong there, and this is not the calling. So I understood when Pastor John said that if you could go, and, and, and Lawson said this too, he goes, if you go and sell insurance, go do that. If you go sell, go, if you go sell houses to go do that. But if you could do nothing else but to follow this calling, it is a noble and beautiful work. And I say this is that you, the body of Christ, would hold this position highly. That you see your pastors, I mean, I get it, not as superstars, not as that, but as humble loving servants willing to sacrifice if your pastor meets these qualifications give him grace when he falls short give him grace when he falls short you see they are not duties like I said these are qualities that are set within him now, the question, <clears throat> the question is that stands is this. Is it legitimate to view these qualifications for pastor, elder, as an ideal for all Christian manhood? I'll repeat it. Is it legitimate to view these qualifications for pastor, elder, as ideal for, for all Christian manhood? The answer is... I won't give it to you now, but I'll give you, it's a yes and a no. And I'll give you the answer at the end of the sermon. And I'll explain. But it is, it's a yes and a no. And these are the points. And literally, these are simple because <clears throat> I'm literally just getting the, the words themselves that you see there in, in, in verse 2. And those are my points. And I go this. It says, it must be above reproach husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, and able to teach. These are the seven that I will actually try to get to through actually as quickly as possible. So bear with me. I will be moving fairly quickly. One, it says above reproach. This, this word means above being blamed or if you wanted to put it in one word, it's blameless. Blameless. And I split this into two, two sub points. And, and the two sub points is blameless in conduct and blameless in Christ. Let me explain this. Blameless in conduct. Look at, uh, just go a couple of pages over, 1 Timothy chapter 5. And this will show us like blameless in conduct. First Timothy chapter five, started in, in verse five. You guys give me some water. <clears throat> verse five. Now she is a widow indeed, and who has been left alone. Let me pause real quick and give you context to this. Yes, it is talking about widows, but it's talking about the conduct of the body of Christ to actually, to actually move upon themselves as elders and, and pastors to actually take care of the body of Christ, to take care of widows in particular. What? Isn't there? There's no water there. <laughs> All right. Um, so in, in context, it's saying, okay, men, uh, leadership, church, this is what how you should conduct yourself in taking care of widows. Let me, let me go further. Verse 5. <clears throat> uh, it says, The widow indeed, and who has been left alone, has fixed her hope on God and continues to entreaties and prayers night and day. But she who gives herself to wanton pleasure is dead even while she lives. Thank you. Oh, shut up. Prescribe these things as well so that they may be above reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his own home, 
and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Okay. Here's the here's the 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 picture that I want to actually paint for you guys. It's the conduct of the leadership here. It's talking about leadership taking care of widows, right? And that this widow hoped in God. She was devoted to prayer. So thus, the conduct of the church, so the conduct of leadership is to take care of their own household. Well, a lot of times that we take this out of context, right? It's talking about the household of God. It's not talking about your house with your kids. So the conduct of this elder should be that, so you don't push this woman that's, an, that's a widow into reproach. In a sense, push her into sin. You actually take her in. So you, you bring her in from a, from a place of, of reproach, from a, bla- a place of, of wanton pleasure, in a sense, that she goes and you're going you're gonna to capture her to, for her not to go on that route. This is the conduct of, of, uh, of an elder. Go, to, go one more in chapter 6 and start in verse 13. And now I'm going deeper into preaching the rest of this book, but when we get there, it'll, it'll all expound on it. Verse 13. Chapter 6, verse 13 says, I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and to Christ and of Christ Jesus, who testifies the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep the commandment with, without stain or reproach. There's that word again, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what is a what is an elder to do? What is their conduct within the church? What is the conduct of men in the church? Is to keep the word, keep sound doctrine, and hold to what we believe. The rightful confession keeps you from reproach, keeps you blameless. You see this a lot with, with false teaching going around. You can't say that a false teacher is blameless. They, they go around teaching false, falsely. So they, they are to blame for what they teach. Now look at uh, Philippians chapter 2. The last verse in this point, Philippians chapter two, uh, verse fourteen: Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourself to be blameless and innocent. That's the same word in the Greek there: reproach, blameless and innocent. Children of God, above reproach, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. So you have this part: says without without grumbling, with, without dispute, away from worldly lust, that what? So you could reflect that you are a child of God, lights in the world. This goes right back to Jesus, right? You know, through all the gospel of John, you see him saying, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. And then towards the end of the gospel of John, he says, you are the light of the world. So we must be blameless in conduct that we not bring reproach upon the calling. The second one is blameless in Christ. I had to really dig for this because this for me was um, uh, a deeper understanding of even the idea of reproach. You see, in, in uh, turn back to chapter 3. And it says in verse 7, chapter 3, verse 7, it says, and he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. This snare of the devil is, is, is what you actually think it is. it is. It is the devil getting a hold of um, someone that may believe that they belong in the church, but they, they profess Christ, but they don't possess Christ. And... And in a sense, like they, they play these things out, that the character and the conduct is not there. So thus, it shows that, that they are vulnerable to the snares of the devil. Isaiah 25, 18, you could jot this down. I'm going to read this for you. It says, I will, swallow up the, I will swallow up death for all time, and the Lord God will wipe their tears away from all faces, and he will remove the reproach of his people for all, from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. 
the Lord will remove that reproach. Before you came to Christ, this is what you were. You carried not the, the whatever the opposite of blameless is. You are doubly blamed. And you carried the reproach for yourself. And Isaiah 25, 8 says that Christ himself would come to wipe away every tear and to remove the reproach. Psalm 78, verse 5 through 7, actually. I think I'm actually going to go through 6. But for he established a testimony in, in Jacob and appointed a, a law in Israel. The law, the law, listen. The law in Israel, the same law that he has written in the hearts of all men. And he says, which he commanded our fathers that they should teach them to their children that the generation to come might know even the children yet to be born that they may arise and tell them to their children that they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. At the end of this, this Psalm, verse 66, this, was the, this is what the Lord says. It says, he drove his adversaries backward. He put on them an everlasting reproach. This shows the, a stiff neckness of, of, of Israel that they would not pass on this, this, beautiful, this beautiful work of God that God is gracious and merciful. And he desires to save through his son. And they, they denied it and they turned from it. But listen to this, Romans 15, 3. I want you to look at this for yourself. Turn to Romans 15 and verse 3. It's only one verse, but it's, it's very, very profound. It says, Romans 15, verse 3, For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. The reproaches that belong to you fell on him. Hebrews 13, 12. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gates. They crucified him outside of Jerusalem. You guys know this. Golgotha was outside. And it says this in verse 13. So let us go out to him outside the camp. This is metaphorical. Let us go outside of the camp, bearing his reproach. That you would metaphorically go outside of the camp and, and gaze upon the cross and you see the reproach that has fallen on him. You see it for yourself. And the point is simple. And it may even sound rhetorical. Your pastor must be saved. Your pastor that's standing in that pulpit to preach this word must be regenerated. He must not hold to his own reproach but his reproach must be lifted. And I tell you this, there's a lot of unregenerated, unsaved pastors in the pulpit today. They don't see themselves, they don't see themselves as a reproach to God. They don't see themselves in that fashion. They see themselves as if they're doing God some sort of favor, that, they, that God needs them to be able to preach this message, but God doesn't need a pastor. God does not need an elder. He desires to use men for his glory. But that pastor must know this. He must know this. If he's not saved, he needs to step out of the pulpit. There's multiple pastors that are not saved. T.D. Jakes, Joe Olstein. Multiple little God's doctrine Pentecostal churches that have a different Christ are not saved. The church that way. Multiple churches all over here. I literally read in a, in a statement, a statement of faith, and I'll put in quotations, statement of faith, that this pastor said, he said two things. He said, we believe that every member in the church is a pastor. Wow. Way to way to lower 
that office and then not just lower it, put it on the floor and step all over it. And then it said this. He says in the second portion, right below that, he says, God is not angry at sinners. Let me tell you something. The reproach that is over the unregenerate's head stands to the day that they yield to the gospel of Jesus Christ. God is angry every day at the sinner. And he calls to the sinner and says, make peace with me. I give you a peace treaty through my son. Make peace with me. And pastors stand in the pulpit, say, no, I'll make my own way. And I'll stand here in my gay pride robes and tell my congregation, it's fine, whatever you believe, it's fine. There are many ways to God. The biggest lie that they can teach. And this comes from pulpits every single Sunday. Your pastor must be saved. Also the popular pastors today. I don't know any pastor that has a great following that is probably not saved. They may be judgmental, but I don't know one. You could maybe point me to one, but I, I don't see any of them. Let's move to the second one. The husband of one wife. Let me let me give you a, a simple understanding because so many scholars have gotten this point and said, "Well, you know, is he talking about polygamy? Is this the is this the point that is set before uh, Timothy to from Paul that he says, "Well, you know, I don't want you to have a man in leadership that has more than one wife." That's that's partly what he's saying, but he's not rebuking polygamy. Polygamy wasn't a thing in, in those days. This phrase is a lot like how we say. Like, that guy right there, that married man right there, he's a one-woman man. He doesn't have divided passions. He doesn't have where he has a relationship with his wife that is deep and, and beautiful. But then he shares a relationship with an, another woman. Maybe, and this is the thing, maybe not a, an affair, per se, but it's a division there. That you give the same sort of attention to other women that you give to your wife. You should never treat your wife how you treat any other woman. Men that are not married, jot this down. You should never treat your wife how you treat other women. Your distinction, how you treat your wife, should be very, very vast. The gap between the way you treat other women, the way you treat your wife, should be like miles apart. You will cause lots, lots of problems in your, in your marriage if, if this is not the thing that you're focused on. It also points to an exemplary marriage. That the, the elders and the pastor's marriages aren't, aren't just like, wow, like that's, that's, that looks like a great marriage. No, they see it and, and people see the marriage and they say, that's the marriage I want. That's the kind of relationship I want with my husband. This is the kind of relationship I want with my wife. An exemplary kind of marriage that stands out above the rest. It shoots forward. And yes, it's because of the leadership of this particular man. Some debate that this is a prerequisite for, for pastoral or elder positions. I would disagree. I, I, I wouldn't say that a, an elder or a pastor um, needs to be married. But I would argue this. It is ideal for a man that holds that office to be married. It is ideal. You know, even 1 Corinthians 7, 7, 8 through 9 would point to this. 
here's what it says. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows that is it is good for them to that they remain even as I am. So this advocated, see, listen to this. That's another argument that we know that that Paul was a pastor elder and he wasn't married. He wasn't married. Don't get that as an excuse, guys. You guys need to get married. You're not Paul the Apostle. Um, and this is why. Verse 9. <laughs> but they do not, uh, but if they ha- do not have self-control, let them marry, for the- it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Let me clear something up real quick. Gentlemen, 20-something-year-olds, listen to me right now. Burning in passion does not mean, listen, this does not mean that you're going home and watching porn. This does not mean that you're going home and having sex with your girlfriend. That's not what this means. The burning is uh, like a smoldering. You have a passion. You like women. That is okay. What is not okay is that you go and get this verse and you say, man, I'm burning with passion. Like, I've been, you know, having sex with my girlfriend for four years. You, bro, you're not burning in passion. You're a straight-up heathen. You are not saved. Burning in passion does not mean that. And he says this. He says, it is better to marry. Let me give you another big point. A lot of you that are waiting... Young men, you're waiting for this, this, and this. All your ducks to fall in a row. Oh, I have a list. When this happens, this happens, and this happens, then I'll get married. Sorry. I caught myself. I was about to say something. That's, I was going to say something worse, but that is stupid. That is very, very stupid. Because... Paul is advocating saying, this is better. So go after this. Get married. Oh, no, but I need to make this kind of money to be able to get married. You're never going to make that money. Listen, you're never going to make that money. You're going to set your your goal here and be like, man, when I make six figures. What? Why? My wife and I had four kids. I didn't make all that much money. Until way later. And I'll tell you this right now. Guaranteed. The Lord always provided. And if you do not pursue marriage. You're being stupid. Yes. Have a full time job. Yes. Finish your, your, your schooling. Yes. Do all that. But that's it. That's it. Get married. Especially if you desire at one point to have this, because I know there's guys out here that have that desire, that I said the aspiration to actually hold this office. And if you have that desire, you should get married. You should get married. Number three, temperate. Temperate. You guys see that word there? So the husband of one wife and then temperate. Temperate in the Greek is used as sober. And a lot of times in the, in the context of, of scripture, when you see scripture, it's talking about a, a soberness in, in, in drink, right? But later on, you see that, that, that he addresses that also. So he's not talking about that. He's not talking about that. The address here is more, of a, more in the sense of, a, of competing passions, okay? Competing passions, meaning um, hobbies, relationships that tug at you, right? The idea of uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 12, that all things are lawful, but not all things are edifying. You know, this is the, the high calling of pastors that if you talk to pastors and you ask them, you know, ask Pastor John or Lawson, whoever, and you ask them, like, do you have hobbies? It's like, well, you know, once in a while I, I go golfing. These men do not have Competing passions. I mean, Steve Lawson created a ministry, one passion ministry. Why? Because his one passion is to preach the word of God. 
And shouldn't this be a calling of your pastor? Shouldn't you want this of him that he says, I could do nothing else but open the book and preach? Not competing and saying, well, what does he do? Well, he collects, he collects miniature trains on his spare time. He, um, you know, he's really into uh, souping up cars. I'm not dogging on the, if, if you could like trains, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> if, if you like cars, I'm like, I'm not dogging on that. I'm sort of dogging on that. Um, I'm saying it shouldn't be a divided heart that, that it's, it's going to be a, a tug to this, a tug to that. And, and these hobbies pull him away from the one main passion that he should have is to preach God's word, to divide the word of truth rightfully and preach sound doctrine that he will not let anything master him apart from the word of god that he goes in and digs in to master the word of god number four prudence this word for prudence i I like this a lot because you know like you think about the puritans and and, you know, the, the reason they were called the Puritans is because of this. I mean, the, the word Puritan or the word, word prudent, like it comes from this idea of, of self-control. Another usage is sensible. Sensible. Look at, look at Titus. Go to, go to the right, and you'll see after a few pages to the right, you'll see Titus. And we're going to look at, at chapter one, but I'm going to bounce around a little bit here in Titus so you could get the point of this idea of sensible, self-control, sensible. Like he, you're not going to choose this one thing that's going to pull you away. And it's, a, it's like divided passions also, but sensible, self-controlled, that he doesn't need. Um, I mean, I hope that you would think to yourself that your pastor doesn't need uh, like strong accountability. Like, you're not calling me and saying, no, man, um, are you in your word today, Uli? Like, I hope that you're not having to call your pastor and thinking that's how I should address him. This man should be endrenched in the word of God. Titus 1, verse 8. Let's take a look at this so we could actually play this out a little bit more. It says, but hospitable. This is uh, qualifications of an elder again, but look in verse 8. It says, be but hospitable, hospitable, loving what is good, sensible. There's the word, just, just devout and self-controlled. He uses both words there. That one is the one that we just seen, and the other one is a, a different word for self-control. But you see the idea is sensible and self-controlled coupled together. Look at chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 2. It says, older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, and perseverance. Jump, uh, look at verse 3. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. The purpose of this is that last part. Is that if your pastor is not sensible, not self-controlled, he brings dishonor to the word and to God himself. Look at verse uh, six. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. So just in case you thought you were going to get away, uh, guys, he literally addressed older men, older women, the older women teaching the younger women, and then the younger men to also be also self-controlled and sensible. This is everybody in the church. This is everyone in the church. Galatians 5.22 says this. And you guys know this, so you guys could rattle it off as I read this. But the fruit of the Spirit is... That was so lame. <laughs> Thank you. Gina was the only one that... <laughs> says, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness self-control against those things there is no law now those who belong to christ jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires if we live by the spirit let us also walk by the spirit let me see this everywhere right this would be magnified 
in your pastor's life that you would see that he doesn't stumble or struggle with the same things you struggle. And you should expect that. You should expect him to have self-control. Next word is respectable. Respectable. The Greek word is proper. Do you guys remember? Uh, turn back to 1 Timothy. I want to show you that this same word is, has been used in chapter 2. Look at verse 9. Uh, this, word, uh, this word respectable or in the Greek means proper. In verse 9 it says, Likewise, I want men, women to adorn themselves with proper clothing. You see, proper means respectable. Right? He says, now, pastors need to adorn themselves, dress themselves with respectability. You should be able to, to see your pastor and say, I, I hold my pastor in high regard with high respect. Because he adorns himself with respectability. Number six, and I'm moving a lot quicker now because we're running out of time, but number six, hospitable. This is, uh, in the context, it's usually used as, as hospitality towards strangers. This means practical kindness, practical kindness. And it does relate to what we would consider hospita hospitality today. Food that you would feed, uh, that you would give drink, that you would give lodging. But the big picture is this, is that a stranger comes in and the pastor, the pastor leads, role, leads the role in this, is that he treats that person as a friend. Everybody that walks in is treated as, as if you've known them forever. That's hospitality. That's true hospitality. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Jot this down. I'm going to just read two verses. Above all, keep fervent. Or verse 8. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. And then he says this in verse 9. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. Now it's talking about those here, the one another's. And this has to be modeled by your pastor. Your pastor cannot be an introvert. He cannot be an introvert. He needs to be able to step out and be able to talk to everyone and have a conversation and be able to Make people feel welcomed. This is what it says. And I'm sorry for even, I, I, I don't even like the word introverted and extroverted. Scratch those out of your mind. Um, you know, those are, uh, the Bible says um, busybodies, right? That's extrovert. Uh, sorry, if you're an extrovert. Um, and an introvert would be more of, of uh well, but talks, when the Bible talks about being timid, and it doesn't about, talk about being timid in a positive sense. Neither one of them are positive, busybody or, or timidity. timidity. And, and, neither, and, and it's not the, the two extremes and you find like your happy medium. It's none of that. You, you throw both of them away and you reflect Christ. What did Christ do? He went to a woman at the well that no one would talk to. She was, she was there at high noon because she was an outcast. And who went to talk to her? Jesus Christ sold hospitality in that moment. And he offered her the living water. This woman was transformed. She ran to the city and says, come see the man that told me all things about myself. The sovereignty of Jesus Christ. Through hospitality. And the last one. Number seven. Able to teach. So now I told you that there was one skill in this whole list. And we're only down to seven. There's 15 of them. But this one skill, this shifts from, from character, from character traits, now to a skill that must be evident in a pastor elder's life. Let me, let me clear something up. It doesn't say that he teaches well. Okay? It doesn't say he teaches well. It says he's able to teach. But the other thing, it's like in the Greek, it actually means skilled in teaching. So he has to be skilled. He has to have the skill. Now, some have better skills than others, right? And that, that's okay. But he has to have some sort of skill. It has to be evident there. Uh, turn to 2 Timothy chapter, chapter 2.
Take it to Timothy chapter 2. Uh, look at verses 1 and 2. It says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This does not fall upon the sole pastor. These churches that have these pastors that carry the weight that he's the only preacher, those, those churches do not have longevity. They go, Paul teaches Timothy, Timothy teaches other men, and he says faithful men. And that points to right back the qualifications that we're looking in chapter 3 of 1 Timothy. Verse 14, and watch, look at verse 14 in, in that same chapter. Remind them of these things, and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words. Young guys, this characterizes a lot of you guys. Do not wrangle about words. It says, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. So everybody around you is going to walk away and say, I didn't get anything from that conversation. What a waste of time. Verse 15, be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for, the, for it will lead to further ungodliness. Verse 17, and their talk will be spread like gangrene among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. If you remember, these are the dudes. These are, it's actually one, this is one of the guys that got kicked out in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Why? Because he was teaching false doctrine. So the goal of this pastor here is not just to teach the word of God, but to refute those that are contrary to it and to kick him out for the sake of the body of Christ. A pastor that's not willing to call out false teachers, uh, he is not worth uh, the ink that is printed on his, pipe, on his Bible. Look at verse 24 and 25. Same chapter. With gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant to them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare. This goes again, the snare of the devil. Having been held captive by him to do his will. The false teachers, listen. You can't say, well, you know. These false teachers, well, you know, they believe in Christ. They're saved. No, they're not. That's not what this says. That's not what this says. You've seen this. You've seen this in your own church in the sense that kind of turning a, a page here and, and just talking to you guys personally about the interactions that you've had with people, with men in your church. You could talk to certain men, and, and when you're done talking, you're like, man, that guy is gifted. That guy is gifted. You wouldn't even say to yourself, that guy is called. He goes, he explains complex or simple things in a way that is highly understandable. Or even at times, even supernaturally clear. So what does the scripture say about these men, these teachers, these pastors? I'm going to go through a few of these scriptures really, really quickly with you. Turn back with uh, to me to 1 Timothy chapter 5. It's just one verse at a time here, but 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 17 says this. The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. These men are, are, are worthy of double honor. Titus, Titus chapter 1. I'm going to go back. I think I read this already, but I'm going to read it again. Holding fast to the word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Galatians. 
6, 6 says this. The one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Don't, don't take your pastors for granted. Colossians 1, 28. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete or mature in Christ. This is his goal. But there's a warning here, James 3, 1. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as much will be as much as will be incurred a judge a stricter judgment on those who teach. So not everyone should be called to this. So back to the question, the answer is this. Men, these qualifications and these these traits, these character traits should be evident. In a Christian man's life. Apart from one that stands out. Which is the skill that I just shared. This is what sets apart the. The other dogs from the pack in a sense. Think about what this list. Says about the office and calling. The reasonable conclusion is that. The character must not contradict the office. In verse, chapter, verse Timothy, chapter 2, verse 10, talking about women, it says that these women making a claim to godliness, these men make the same claim. They make a claim to godliness in their position, and they must honor it. Men and women of God, you make this claim every day. By means of identifying and claiming Christ, you make this claim every single day. Your pastor is called to this standard, but so are you. Cling to your hope in him. Pursue him. Love him. Let's pray. Lord, we pray now that confessing that we fall short or of many of these um, character traits, or in, and, and these character traits that are best reflected in the person and work of your son, that as he walked this earth, that he was the epitome of all these, all these qualities. We pray now that you would work in us, Lord, that you would transform us, Lord, that we would be able to be witnesses for you, that we bring honor to you in practicing all these things, or not for for your brain glory, but Lord, for your glory, for your purpose, Lord, that we may reflect the gospel to those around us and that they may, in a sense, see our good works, Lord, and come to you to be pardoned. I pray now for our pastors at Grace, Lord, not by name, but you know them all. I pray for the elders. Lord, that you would be with them, Lord, strengthen them, that we know that the attack of the enemy is, is great around them. Lord, strengthen them. Lord, keep them close to you. Drive them to your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.